morning and greetings to you all in the mighty name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Aloha, malorele, nisambula vinaka. Yeah, welcome all this morning to uh, our coming together on the Lord's Day so that we can give Him glory, honor, and praise as He so rightfully deserves. I'll open us up in a prayer and I'll hand it back over to the team for a time of worship. Thank you so much, Father, for we've heard this morning that you are our, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Father, we are so grateful, Lord, for your, um, your love, your peace, your guidance that you give to us on a daily, Father. This morning as we come together, we come together as a family to lift up your name, for you are uh, worthy of all praises, Father. Bless us as we uh, uh, join together as a family. To worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> It says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Olawa fiona o le sulu le yo uvai. Malemala malamma yo uala. There's a beautiful verse that illustrates how God's word 
illuminates the steps and the path of the psalmist. Darkness is the absence of light. I say that again, darkness is the absence of light. That is from Albert Einstein Tivori. And I'm talking about the physical darkness. Or Bongisa, or Boluri, or Ileai, or Semala Malama. In the physical, walking in the light allows us to walk confidently, at a quick pace if need be, and have foresight of what path we want to take, because there is the presence of light. But take away that light, and we're taking baby steps with our hands stretched out like this. So we don't dong our heads or stub our feet, smash our shins. Why? Because there is no light. The psalmist has expressed in this whole chapter that his life before loving God's word was a life of bumps and bruises and downfalls in his unguided darkness. Or in other words, no word of God has a lamp for his feet. No word of God has a light for his path. But now he walks with confidence in God's ways, God's laws, God's testimonies, God's judgments, and God's word. Why? Because his own words in this previous chapter, I will read from Verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Also in the same chapter, verse 24. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counsel. Also in verse 30. Verse 30 I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. God's word is the lamp for his feet. And it is the light for his path. The psalmist has expressed that it is God's word that has, that has directed and guided his life away from the things that caused him to stumble and fall. To a life where God's word is evident in his entire decision making. As we sing his praises and hear his holy word being preached, may we too solely rely on God's word to shine brightly in every situation of our own lives. Let his word lead and guide our steps and paths away from lusts of this fallen world, selfish desires and personal gain and be led to be hearers and doers of his word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forever and ever. Amen. Hand it back up to the team, we shall sing another song of worship.
the word of God this morning, brought to us by our brother Fred. Yeah, uh, empty yourselves so you can be filled with the word of God this morning. <coughs> this is name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Ian, uh, for leading our service uh, this morning. Greetings to some of our family that's able to visit us today. Uh, great to have you guys with us uh, today uh, and this morning. Uh, turn your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We'll be looking at verses uh, 13 uh, through to 19 today. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 13 uh, to 19. Yeah, I'll sound here to tell you. I'm going 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 to tell you. Let us pray and we will uh, hear the word of the Lord. So we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, um, and in this particular chapter, uh, we've been, uh, we're going to continue on from last week's sermon. So last week's sermon, we have been talking about uh, two particular spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the Bible, uh, one of them being uh, the gift of prophecy, or the gift of preaching, or the gift of sharing and teaching the Word of God. Uh, and the other spiritual gift that we've also been looking at is this gift, um, the gift of tongues. Uh, we've now come to understand the gift of languages. Um, and so we've been sitting in this chapter to understand what the Word of the Lord tells us about these things. Just so that we can give you a bit of context uh, for the, our friends that have been visiting. Uh, we will be looking at the Bible in its entirety. Uh, so we look at it in a chapter, we look at it verse by verse, and we've been exploring chapter 14 of the letter of 1 Corinthians. And um, this particular letter is specific to this particular church. Uh, and the truths that are spoken to this church at Corinth, we can also learn as a church of today. Specifically though, uh, the gift of tongues and the gift of languages uh, to this particular early church uh, God had used in the time of the early church, in the apostolic age, to establish the church. Uh, so God had used this specific uh, gift of languages, gift of tongues, uh, in the early church to establish the church and the spreading of the gospel and the good news. But we also note in this particular chapter, chapter 14, Paul speaks specifically to the church at Corinth, because of the misuse and the abuse of this particular gift and some of the spiritual gifts noted that were being used at this church. Mm -hmm. 
leta tau po le fao nga ina se se o me alofa a uh, o tui na mai ele tua ilana e kalesia le la pe e ya nei la le tato mata uku ile mata uku se fulu mane fa pe yo se tu si ya o ai ale apostolo ile e kalesia korinito ai ma na ya ma wai fo ila le o unga mota to ile e kalesia iona o nei. So today we're going to be looking at verses 13 and uh, right through to 19. Uh, but in essence, uh, this is one full paragraph from uh, verse 6 through to verse 19. So I'm just going to sort of look at it as a part two today, um, as a continuation from last Sunday. We're going to be looking at three areas. Uh, number one, gifts. The gift used in error. Uh, the gift used as an emotional rather than a spiritual gift but also the fact that the true gift of speaking in tongues was to be used to edify. A uh, i koronito ini falangona. Ah, uh, pe wasa ili ini mea elangona ai pe ina ia mawai se falangona le lei. Au noa male mea faalea nana. Malona tolu. Ah, uh, ole faonga ina ole mea alofa lea ole tautala ina nana ese ese. E au wai ina ia ihu ile faama fana fana ina. So we'll be looking at those three points as we cover these uh, verses today. But let's read the word of the Lord. Um, those of us with New King James Version Bibles, I'll ask you to read. And uh, any other translation, you can follow through. And then we'll ask our Psalm 1 Bible readers to read as well. Let us read the word of the Lord in English. Therefore, Ia. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say Amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding, that I may teach others also, than ten thousand words in a tongue. Uh, 
Paul um, starts there in verse 13 with the word therefore. Mm -hmm. He says, therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. When you see the word therefore, this is, he's about to make a point from everything that he's spoken about earlier on. Remember, if we think about what Paul has spoken about up to this point, right from chapter 12, that the gifts have been given to the believers for the benefit of the church. Remember back in chapter 12, uh, verse 11, we understand that the spiritual gifts have been given to the believers, to the church, for the benefits of the church. When we read verse 11 in chapter 12, it says there, Paul writes, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So as he writes chapter 14, he has in mind the fact that the Holy Spirit has given these gifts. The, prof the gift of prophecy, the gift of speaking in tongues. Uh, so I tato mana to natu le upu lea uh uma natu ato or polo ili mutaku sumarfa e be e tawa fa ye mea uma yesa tu siya to wai polo imata upu ne to be on a tatu ilo me mutakus full male dua u mea lufa fa leanga u tu wina elianga pa ia in a ia fa bea on a fa malusia ma fausia ma piso soani ai le kalesia. When we also look at chapter 13, when we look at the most excellent way, when uh, the apostle was emphasizing and, and telling the, the church in Corinthians that when we consider our spiritual giftings, that we must seek the most excellent way. And that most excellent way we see in chapter 13 was the selfless and was the sacrificial love that we get from the scriptures. In verse 8 of chapter 13, it reads there, Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. But love never fails. So Paul has love in mind, and he's writing chapter 14, that love is the most excellent way of all the spiritual gifts that have been given the church. Manatu foiolotu siet paulon tapusumar fa. Male male mata upule ile tomo nta pusuma tolu ile awala e sili sili lefa me yelfa ipuna e balu ole lofa ele uma fa me e peni perfetanga e fa ale angaina peni ngana e mavai pe yole foto e fa ale angaina dia a ole lofa le lofa tuina tu le lofa ele toe manau ina ia tau ia mai ole lofa dia ele Uma, uma natu ia olo o iai a paulo, a o tu sia le mata upu e se fulo male fa. We might also consider that at the beginning of chapter 14, Paul writes specifically about the primacy of prophecy, the gift of preaching and teaching. That Paul was saying to the church, out of these two gifts, the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy, now we understand that the gift of prophecy is not foreseeing the future, but it's forth telling the truth. It's the preaching and the sharing of the truth. It's the dividing and the rightly dividing of the truth. The preaching of the scriptures. What we are doing today. Ah, that prophecy in its definition, it's the preaching of God's word. And at the beginning of chapter 14, out of these two gifts, he's saying to the church at Corinth that it's the priority to prophesy more so than the gift of tongues. And that's all my for 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 Eli, I'm a tongue on him to have a summer far. Although I'm a far more and more in the Apostolo Polo, Ile me alofa ole perofetanga, Manatua, ole perofetanga, ele ole loa o mea ile lumana, ole perofetanga, ole la unaina ole upu, ole aoa oina ole upu, ole aoa ina, e moa ele tangata, my left yonga, but ear. Now, 
eta utala ia itangata ina ia faa maa fana fana ai maa poa poa iai ma feto ma iai that when we look at verse 3 of chapter 14 with regards to the superiority of prophecy over the gift of tongues verse 3 says there but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men so when Paul says this morning in verse 13 he says there therefore ah, everything that he has spoken about up to this point he's he's emphasizing the point here when we refer to our uh, sermon last week that the pursuit of the gift of tongues the the true gift of tongues ah, the gift of languages the pursuit of that gift was always for edification ah, that it was for those who were within the realms of the church and that God would use someone with the gift of tongues that the Spirit had given this particular grace to, to use that gift in order for someone who was part of the church that may not necessarily know the Greek language among them and they were able to use that gift for the edification. So we remember last week in verse 5 of chapter 14 and it says there, um, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So, in the next time, in the next time, in the next time, in the next time, in the next in the Ole fanga ina ole nga na ese o ita tu te iloi o lo tala noa paulo ile me alofa ilonga fa anga ina se se ah so for my paulo ole ne ole ta tala ile nga na ese ina ta talo ia o ia ina ia mafai ona fa a matala ina ele o fa a tawa ina e paulo le me alofa ole nga na ese ile ile fa upule ya. I only know now to ingo Paulo. I find your life on a ina le me alofa le ilona ilona awala se se. Tatalo ina ima fai ona fa matalo. I find your life on a ina se se koronito. O ele ai so na on a ya tato. Be on a tato ilona ba ya so na te ane a be on se fangu fangu. A le fe fati fati ya ilona leo. Ele ma fai se tasi ona ilona le fati ona pesi ona o ta ina. That he says here in uh, verse 13, Therefore let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. It's not that Paul is, um, is advocating this, uh, the counterfeit gift here. What he's actually saying, if you're going to use this, then pray that you interpret it so that there is understanding. Mm -hmm. His point is that there needs to be understanding. Mm -hmm. So rather than advocating for the gift, he's making a point. I've spoken about all of these things with regards to spiritual gifts, with regards to this gift, it needs, to put, it needs to end up in the edification, the exhortation, the comfort of the church. What was happening here at the church at Corinth was total opposite. It was total chaos. Ah. So therefore, Paul opens up today's sermon as we continue from um, understanding the gift of tongues um, and also the counterfeit gift that was happening here at the church of Corinth. Paul was saying, therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue. Again, in the King James Version, it's the unknown tongue. Or the gibberish. Or the ecstatic sounds and utterances. A lot of us have seen or have experienced that um, in our world before. Um, so this counterfeit gift, uh, this pagan form of worship that had crept into uh, the church at Corinth, Paul was saying that's not the actual gift. That's a misuse. That's an abuse of what the gift is that the Holy Spirit had gifted the church. But he says there in 13, he who speaks in a tongue, pray that he may interpret. So Paul, again, it's not that he's advocating the counterfeit gift, but he would say, rather point out, make sure that it ends up in terms of comforting, building, and exhorting and edifying the church. The meaning of the word interpret there comes from the Greek, uh, Greek form um, of a word to be, uh, have an unfold of the meaning of what is being said. So Paul already was saying, man, this is, this is the counterfeit gift, but if you're going to use something like that, pray that you interpret it. It's almost like, a, it's almost like his way of 
um, a sarcasm. Uh, and you know that Paul uses sarcasm throughout all his letters. Uh, and he said, well, if you're going to use this counterfeit gift, interpret it somehow so that people can be edified. Because otherwise you're just um, a flute and a harp that makes no sense um, on someone that doesn't know how to play. So what he's after is for the fact that there needs to be um, edification in the church. Just so that we understand, it's good for us to actually go back um, and look at um, the, the gift of tongues in its truest and purest form. In a year that we law, le me alofa le au le tau tala ina nana ese ese ile au maina ele atua o le ne me alofa mo le e kalesia. And we find this in um, the birth of the church. Uh, we see it in Acts two, uh, verse one uh, through to to eight. Because when we read there, it helps us understand what is the real gift of tongues. And we've covered this previously, and I just wanted to come and bring it again today for us to understand the actual gift of tongues. So we read in chapter 2 of Acts. It says there in verse 1, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse 3, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Four, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When we see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit here at the birth of the early church, we see that there are the coming of the Holy Spirit um, in the upper room, and we see this beautifully displayed in, uh, in Acts chapter 2. Let's read on in verse 5. It says there, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Ah, so the original gift of the true gift of speaking in tongues was a known language. Verse seven, and then they were all amazed and marvelled, saying to one another, "Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born?" And then you see right through to verse eleven. That there were a list of the different uh, uh, nations that were represented that heard their own language. So the gift of tongues is not the ecstatic utterances, it's not the sounds, it's not the noises uh, that are very closely related to pagan type worship. But it's actually a gift of spoken languages that we see here in Acts chapter 2. Lato. Ole ole me alofa ole tau tala inga ngana ese ese. Ole me alofa ole tau tala inga ngana. Ele ose ele ele oni fa upunga poni memu me memu memu ola mutu le ai ole inga ngana 
ça ou ça là. Si le si l'année il fait pour et fit ou mal fait pour val. Fait mais ou a seigneur là tu mauli, mauli là tu rofoi ou a fait ça ou ça là ça là. Fauta et le okali là ya air il a tu umma oe ça ou ça là mais ne. Et fa pe faire faut y on a ça ou ça et ça si mais fa alongo a tu il a na lava na nana na tu pour mal ya. O otangata ia o otala noa, otangata uwa vaava ai le vaa venga o le tautala ina ngana esi esi O e na asi asi atu Yerusalema ili teimi o sa tausa mingo le pente koso Ma uwa lato o faalo ngu atu, hui O nga ngana o mata watu nuu ia o lo otautala mai ai tangata nei So le faa nga ina ili atua o le vaa venga o le tautala ina ngana esi esi E au lava ina ia manino ya te itato ta mama tina e kale esi ia Ole me alofa ole tautala ngangana. Ah, ole ngangana tautala. So the gift used in era in uh, the church at Corinth, Paul was, in his sarcasm, says here, man, if you're going to use this gift, make sure that you pray to interpret the gift. So then we move into verse 14 through to 17, because here what we see here is that the church, rather than seeking the actual gift, or rather than using that gift in its truest form, in its purest form, was using it in, or misusing it in a number of ways. Number one, they were abusing it. Number two, they were also using it in a way to, for pride. Ah, it was a way to, to, to show off. That's what they were using it for. Atato o mata mata ile faonga ina o le ekale siya o le neime alofa, Ua au noa ma le faale a nana, a ua faa ngā ina ili au wala e saa ili ai faa langona. Be o se mea ina ia faa langona, be maua ini ni langona, tau faa fia fia i lava e ia, ia lava. What they were seeking here was, rather than the edification of the church, was an emotional experience for self-edification. Do you see the opposite? Uh, that they weren't using this gift for the edification of the church. They were using this gift rather to build or to have a feel-good emotion and a self-edification emotion. And unfortunately, that's what we see in the misuse of this particular gift in a lot of Christian circles today. Why? Why? Because there is no clarification of what is said in Scripture. But let us read what it says in verse 14. It says, therefore, Paul says, if I pray in a tongue, again, in the King James Version, it says, unknown tongue. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Uh, and what we see here is, uh, we see the word pray, and we see the word in a tongue, and we see the word my spirit Praise. And we just want to sort of pause here, because there are a lot of teachings out there uh, that you may also come across, where people would often encourage people to have, hey, what's your prayer language? Or, hey, what's your private prayer um, to God? And you, they would often refer to this verse in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, um, and they say, oh, you can pray in a language that only you and God know. And they'll point to this very verse as a supporting verse to, to encourage people to pray in such a way so that God can hear their prayers. Mm. And I think in that, we're limiting God. It's like, man, the Lord knows everything. Even before a word is on our tongue, the psalmist says, He knows. Why would we want to come to Him in a special language if He knows everything that we're about to pray about? So this is a verse that would be often misinterpreted uh, to support this notion around a prayer language before God. And so um, other verses that are often used is Romans 8 verse 26, where it talks about um, the Holy Spirit uh, praying on our behalf. If you look at uh, Romans 8 verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 
Uh, there's other verses that they would refer to where in Ephesians 6 verse 18 where it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In Jude 1 verse 20, it, um, they would use this other verse to support uh, that notion of praying in the Holy Spirit. So a lot of verses would sometimes be mischaracterized to support the notion of praying in the Spirit. But what we see is that all of those verses do not actually refer to speaking or praying in tongues. Um, that when we look at Romans 8, when it says there that, um, that there are groanings and utterances that cannot be understood, it's not us that's doing the praying in that verse. It says there, the Holy Spirit himself makes intercession. So when we look at that verse, it's, not the, it's saying that we have no idea what to pray for. So therefore the Holy Spirit himself will intercede on our behalf. It does not mean that we will start to go before the Lord with groanings that we cannot understand. So that again, that's a misinterpretation of these verses. Praying in the Holy Spirit is not praying in tongues. It's that we are praying with the Holy Spirit's help inside of us to bring our prayers before the Lord and to make our prayers before the Lord. So, a faita wina of awa a fai o te tatalo ile nangana ese ua tatalo ai lo ua nganga po ole ma nava ole tangata a ua le fua mai a ni fua e lo ma fau fau ole ale wingo upu ia lo fai mai paulo fai mai ole tangata e tautale ile nangana ese po le fau ngai na se se ole me alofa wa na ona na alu ole savili ma le ma nava o mutu a fai mai ele fua mai ile Mafal <laughs> That when we look at those words that Paul uh, brings there to us, uh, in understanding context, words, uh, so that we understand what Paul is saying here. Because it says, therefore, if I pray in a tongue, or an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Here's another supporting text that helps us understand this text. Because that word spirit will also be misinterpreted many times to mean the Holy Spirit. But the word spirit um, in its Greek form is the word pneuma. And the pneuma is also translated Holy Spirit. But another word for spirit here is the word breath. So what Paul is referring to here, for if I pray in a tongue, my breath or these utterances or these sounds are praying. How do we know that? Because therefore, he says at the end of 14, my understanding is unfruitful. He himself has no idea what he's saying. So let alone trying to edify the church. And so this is, um, this is Paul saying, so if, uh, for if I pray in a tongue, or if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, or my breath is praying, or this sound is praying, these utterances that are coming out of my mouth is praying, but my mind is unfruitful as it says there my understanding is unfruitful so the unknown tongue the gibberish or the un uh, the uh, the utterances that cannot be understood was not being understood by the speaker 
or by he who was using this gift themselves. So, elefua maini fua elo umafofau, olona winga, ua noa oia malemala malama, ile fati nonga, se se ole mea rofa. Lele fa me lona alfa ipesuma lima, fa me alfa ipesuma lima, ia, a fa pefea, o te tatalo ile anganga, o te tatalo foi ile mafofau, o te pese ile anganga, o te pese foi. Ile mafa o fau. O mea umba e faatino le tangata ilona so e fua fa le nana. O le tangata kirisiano e ye fo i malona mafa o fau a. O le tangata fa le nana e e le fa ape e faatino se me alofa fa le nana. Au noa male yai o lo loto malo mafa o fau. Au le tele o mea yo faatino yona pone pe wo faatino. Ai pe wo wo tu wo tu fau le tangata lona tino ina ye faatino ai. Fati no ma se se. O le mea lan le na lefa mei fai pwes fulma le lima. A o te talo, a o pese, o te pese ilo wanganga. A toa fo ila, ma lo ba fa o fao. That in verse 15 where it says there, what is the conclusion then, Paul says? What does he conclude? He says here, I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit. And I will also sing with the understanding. Praying and singing, uh, here are two uh, things that happen or two key parts of when we come together in corporate worship. There is corporate prayer, there is corporate singing. But Paul is emphasizing here that it must be done unto the edification. We see that in further down in verse 26. Let all things be done for edification. That our lives spiritually, brethren, will never exclude our mind. And that was, that, was the, that was the picture of pagan worship. That they would go into these deep trances and almost let their body go into these, into these certain ways of worship. And unfortunately, we see that in our charismatic movements a lot. And how do, So we therefore need to be warned. We therefore need to learn. How do we as a church biblically understand what the gift of tongues truly is. So we now know it's, it's, not a, it's not an utterance, it's not a sound, it's not something that you just, that comes out of your mouth. It's a spoken language. It's not something that you do without your mind. Okay, because it says there in 14, um, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. No, for a believer, everything is done with our mind. When we think about Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, it talks about there that, that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, and, uh, and this is our reasonable service unto God. It says there, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we worship God, not just with our breath or our, our, our words, no, we worship Him with our mind. Huh? That we look further down in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Ah. So, atato mafofao ile, soifua o le tangata faaleanganga, le soifua oe le tangata kirishiano, atato mafofao ile faaongaina, Sao, ah, po le fao ngai na tatau o me alofa o le tau tala ina ngana ese ese. E le ma fayo na tau tu wau no ina e le anganga o le tangata lo na ma fao fao. E faati no ese me ha le ai e faati no u malaba ilo ultino ilo anganga ilo malosi malo ma fao fao. Ah, au no no malo ma fao fao lo no winga ah o tatala o le ava no ah ina ia ia. More mere esse esse in a yaw or my yate oe ah. Because then it says further down there in verse 15, uh, verse 16 and 17. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he uh, who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So this is Paul's point always with regards to using the spiritual gift. It's for the edification of another. What they were using was the counterfeit gift. It was for self-edification. It was for self-gratification. It was not for the building up of the church. 
So he says there in verse 16, Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? So the misuse of this gift, um, there was, it was unnecessary, because everybody at the Church of Corinth could speak the language. Uh, they could speak the language. It was unnecessary to use this gift, but because of pride, uh, because of uh, having a showy gift, they were starting to put this gift above the teaching gift, above the prophecy gift. So therefore, all of those things was causing them to misuse this gift. So uh, the unlearned and the uninformed there, it talks about the unlearned or the unskilled. Uh, he who does is not a believer. Ah, it says there further down that the tongues are for a sign. In verse 22, the tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. So, atato mafafau ile, 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 tau mafai o le apostolo, ina ia faa mau tu wina le manatu. Le la fai mai e lola fai kwe sfuma le ono mai sfuma fitu, a le faa pea pe a e faa fetai ile anganga, pe e te faa fetai ile anganga, a ese le a o lo o faa sese, pe faa pe fea ona a mene mai ila o faa manu o le nofo ile mea e nofo ai le tangata valea, a uh, ina ua le langona e ia la upu. A wā ua mā lie lava lau fa manu A uh, ua le fa a mā whana whana ina le tasi. So ole ole mau a tō Paulo i a i u mea uma lava i le fa a mā whana whana ina. Ai, ona ole fa o ngā ina se se ole me alofa ua whaia i a le whaitaria a le tangata ua manatu fa a maua lunga le tangata Ma ua le iu i le fa'a ma fana fanaina. So we've covered off um, verse uh, 13 through to verse 17 today. The gift used in error. The gift used to seek emotions uh, rather than anything spiritual or edification of the church. But I love the way that Paul actually ends this particular segment. Because in the final segment, he re-emphasizes that the gift, the actual gift, was to build the church. Ah, that there was the, the purest form of, the truest form of the gift of tongues. The actual gift is to edify the church. And we know that in the early church was used. Uh, and, and, you know, often uh, the English language now is the most used language around the world. Uh, and there are many different languages that we are now able to use in our day, we see it function here at church. Uh, for our Samoan speakers, I would use the Samoan language. Mm. And then for the rest of us, I would use the English language. Ah, so language has become a, a useful tool in the work of the Lord. But in the time of Corinthians, the gift of tongues, because this is someone who does not know a language, <coughs> but the Lord enables him to speak that language for God's purposes. And we see it used. Ah, and Paul says there in verse 18, I thank my God. I speak with tongues, and this is the actual gift. He says there, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. So Paul, the apostle, uh, obviously <laughs> had this gift of languages, especially because he was called to the Gentiles. So he was called to uh, the nations outside of Israel. Um, and so the Lord will probably um, have probably enabled him to be able to share and minister the gospel uh, using this particular gift. But note that Paul does not write about it anywhere. Uh, we don't see it written. Um, what we do see written is Paul preaching the gospel. What we do see, uh, what Paul writes is the gospel. He is unashamed about the gospel. He never talks like that about the gift of tongues, which he had. So that, that sort of gives us also another uh, insight to the heart of how the, the, pr the primacy of prophecy, or the preaching of the word, and the fact that the gift of tongues was for a certain period of time. Isaiah 
in the ifa baina ma ifa mautu ma ya fa mautu wina ni fe au ole tal ni ne lela fa mai paulo fa mai if i puna suma balu out fa tai lo tua ina wa tele la uta uta la ngana se se itt na uta uma if i mai puna suma leiba i pay tai uta lokso ina ia uta uta la ile kalesia ini upu selima ma lo uma fo fa ina ia owa owa watu ini si i uta le lokso in the mano ise ngana ese. Then when we look at verse um, verse eighteen, he says that I have this gift, uh, and, and so obviously Paul had used this gift on his mission journeys. But he says in verse nineteen, and this is where Paul emphasizes the priority of speaking intelligent words. Uh, and he says there in verse nineteen, we read, yet in the church. I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than ten thousand words in a unknown tongue. And we see that he contrasts using a handful of words compared to a myriad and myriads of unintelligible words. And what do we see here? And, and it's wonderful uh, just to see how Paul um, prioritizes um, the, the understanding component. Because he says there, yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding. Uh, he's saying, I would rather speak words that people will understand. I'd rather say five words, which is probably a sentence, and that's it. But if people understand those five words, then that's, I've done my bit. Uh, and then he says there, um, that I may teach others also. And this is the point. This is the reason why we preach in a language so that you can understand. This is why we use our gifts so that men and women in the church can be built up, so that they can be edified. And I love the word that he uses there, that I may teach others. And that word, kata ekeo, it means to sound down to the ears or to instruct orally. So he's saying, I would rather speak words that will be able to teach someone so that they understand than to speak many words and they have no idea what I'm saying. Um, 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 Ina ia ha o wa o ai ole ole wingo upu na ha o wa o tu sa o um ole ole fa a leo ina ia tu inatu le fe au ina ia mana malama um e ye le upu sa mo ale masani no fa fa alongo yai um sa tu umutu ha na tu umutu watu o tato tama talo tato ai na ha pe o pe o le ata foli na na tu umutu e paulo Ina ia ma lama lama ha na 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 fai lo ma wa o e paulo ina ia ma lama lama fa me sili la le tu ina tu na ku puselima lo le mano o isi u pu ele ma lama lama ile kalesia to ya u noa ma le fa ma fa na fa na ina the word there um, that he uses to contrast so the thing is he says i'd rather give you five words than 10000 words the greek word uh, myrios where we get the english word myriad uh, to uh, to describe something that is countless, something that is innumerable. Uh, so he's saying this whole uh, speaking in tongue, in a tongue, uh, with all of this uh, gibberish and all of these sounds that are coming out, I'd rather speak just five words mm. rather than giving you all of the myriad of words that you do not understand. Uh. So he says, we read there in verse 19, Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a unknown tongue. Uh. So brethren, what's the takeaway for us? The takeaway for us is that we must continue to seek the Spirit to give us what it is that He wants us to use. Uh. It might, obviously the, spiritual, um, the gift of tongues was for uh, the time of the church. But there are still gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us in operation for the church today. How are we using your gifts? So if you do know your gift, how are you using it? Are you using it in a way that it's to benefit yourself? Is it for self-edification? Or are you using it in a way that it benefits the church? That it builds up 
the church. Final question though is, if I don't know anything about spiritual gifts, if I don't know anything about the church, then do I know who Christ is? And then that's a question too. That's a serious question for us today. Do I know who Christ is? Or am I, am I attending church just to tick, tick the Sunday exercise, tick the Sunday activity, bring the kids to Sunday school? Am I attending religiously? Or do I genuinely love the Lord? And do I genuinely seek one of those gifts that I must operate in? We were talking earlier on in our Psalm 1 class that when we, talk, when we think about justification, we have been justified, praise God. We have been justified through faith in Christ's death and burial and resurrection. But after that, the justification part, we must work. There's the growing part. There's the bearing fruits component. So brethren, as we come together to the end of our sermon today, um, these things, great to understand, uh, great to have this knowledge. But remember, in the book of Corinthians, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, right? So the most excellent way is how do we do these things in love? How do you continue to love the Lord with your mind, your heart, your soul, and your strength? But how do we continue to pursue these things? It's we pursue it because we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So be encouraged, brethren, today. Uh, be encouraged in knowing a little bit more about the church at Corinthians um, and, and learn from their mistakes as well. Uh, so praise the Lord, um, uh, bless you family as you hear the word of the Lord and the teaching of the word of the Lord this morning. Let us stand, uh, let's do a bit of a stretch um, and I will pray uh, and then we will hand our service back to uh, Brother Ian for uh, the ending of our service today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Um, we thank you that even in uh, the letter of Paul to Corinth and inspired by the Holy Spirit and the work of you, Lord, that you wanted to clearly lay out the blueprint uh, for the churches, uh, even the churches of today. Father, as we look at the, the gift of speaking in tongues and understand what the true gift is, but then also understanding the misuse of this gift teaches us. It gives us principles on how we are to be as the church of today. That our gifts are not to be for self-edification. That our gifts are to be for the building up, the exhortation, and the building, and the uh, edification of the church. So we give you glory, Lord, for the truths that you've given us today. And we pray these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us be seated, church, and I'll hand it over to Brother Ian. Thank you.